Hello, you intergalactic beings. It's time for another conversation from South by Southwest 2022. This one takes us back to the red carpet for the premiere of The Man Who Fell to Earth, a new Showtime series from the minds of Alex Kurtzman and Jenny Lumet. The Man Who Fell to Earth is inspired by the 1963 Walter Travis novel of the same name, which tells the story of Earth's future being in the hands of an alien who arrives on the planet at a pivotal moment in its history. The Man Who Fell to Earth was also the title of the 1976 film adaptation starring David Bowie as the alien. This Showtime series picks up the story decades after the fictional end of the book and the original film. During this podcast, you'll hear from actors Naomi Harris, Bill Nye, and Jimmy Simpson, as well as Kurtzman and Lumet, who co-created, co-wrote, co-produced, and directed the series. I need to explain something to those watching these interviews on my YouTube channel. I was without a camera person and filming these with an iPhone, so thank you for bearing with the unorthodox vantage point. Specifically with Kurtzman and Lumet, the camera remained on Alex most of the time. That was not intentional, and I hope it isn't too distracting because I especially enjoyed our back and forth. Without further ado, here are the filmmakers behind The Man Who Fell to Earth, starting with Oscar nominee Naomi Harris, who plays Justin Falls. Naomi, thank you so much for the time today. So uh, what is your role in this series? Um, I play Justin, and Justin is um, a scientist who helps the alien Faraday um, understand. She's kind of his eyes and, and window into the, the world of humanity. David Bowie was obviously the uh, the original character in the movie back in the 1970s. He uh, served as an inspiration for the continuation of the character, too. I'm curious, are you a fan of David Bowie, the human, the musician? What's your favorite David Bowie song? Um, I don't really have a favorite David Bowie song, and I don't know whether I would describe myself as a fan of his, but I, I'm definitely an admirer of his work and, um, and his humanitarianism as well. Fantastic. Last question. I'm a big fan of 28 Days later best zombie movie of all time was that film as intense to make as it uh, played out on screen it was very intense to make yeah it was uh, done in like guerrilla filming style so we didn't actually have permission to shut down streets and, and roads in London so what we did we'd shoot really early in the morning in summer so like the sun would be up at like 4 a.m. and um, just people would wear high-vis jackets and stop people going down streets and what have you which was highly illegal but we got our shots just adds to the greatness Naomi thank Thank you so much, and uh, congratulations on this series. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hi, Bill. I'm Trey. Hey, Trey. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I have heard you a couple different times now uh, describe this film as funny, romantic, heroic, and weird. Yeah. Those things all appeal to me, too. How is it weird? It's weird because some of the stuff, I can't tell you because otherwise it would spoil it for you, but some of the, st some of the technological stuff is very, very extraordinary, and some of the... Uh, the, the the gifts that the aliens bring from uh, the other planet are, you know, they, they really just, they're so witty and so clever and so extraordinary. What do you play in this? I play Thomas Jerome Newton, who uh, was the original man who fell to Earth, and he's been, uh, as people who saw the film will remember, they took his eyes, they took his science, and they hounded him, that being the human species and he's been running he's been on the run for 45 years and he's been trying to uh, evade capture and also work out what happens next and what happens next is this TV series so uh, David Bowie as you just mentioned was the character in the original movie you've done a lot of good work over the time uh, over time did you ever uh, cross paths with David Bowie in life I did cross paths with David Bowie on a couple of occasions and he was deeply charming I was a huge fan of his I I did actually perform for him a couple of times and for he and his wife they came and saw me in a play in London some years ago and then late, more recently in New York and he was very very charming and I was I made a big mistake of looking in the house seats you always know where the, 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 the kind of guests are going to be and I looked straight into David Bowie's eyes, which made the evening like hell, because I, I knew that <laughs> one of my heroes was in the audience. But he came around afterwards, was very, very charming, and uh, and uh, you know, and I'm, I, you know, I come from not very far from where he, you know, I was brought up in similar circumstances, you know, very, very close together, and uh, I'm obscurely proud, you know, to uh, there's a few things move you to patriotism. It's a little early for that, but one of them might be David Bowie. Oh, that was a great answer. Thank you for that. And uh, final question. At least in the original movie, the uh, the Thomas character, which is, uh, character was distracted by three vices: booze, 
sex, and television. I would like you to power rank those three things and their meaning in your life. In the meaning in my life? Yes. No, I'd rather stick to the character Thomas Jerome Newton. But uh, and, and if you want me to rank them for him, it would be booze uh, and television. And then I don't think there's a lot of sex where, where he's been in the last 40 years. Fair enough. All right, well, uh, thank you very much. Appreciate it and looking forward to checking it out. My pleasure. Thank you. Hey, Jimmy. Yeah, I'm Trey. Hey, Trey. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Big fan of your work over oh, the years. Thanks, bro. Looking forward to this one as well. Sure. So, uh, it's been reported that you uh, described this series in three words as way fucked up. Yeah. I'm the one reporting it because I heard it about two minutes ago. Okay. Now, that'll never see the light of the day. Of course. Uh, light of day on the one that uh, got it, but yeah. how was it way fucked up? Well, I think uh, Alex and Jenny are dealing with the frailties of being human. In, in a way, because normally we investigate them inside. I'm a father, I don't know, I'm, this is family issues. No, this is how humans behave and how an outsider perceives it and how off-putting that would be for someone to come in from another planet and see how we behave, how we treat each other with emotions, um, in, in, uh, politically, in, uh, how we treat the world, the earth, um, and, um, and, and it's fucked up. That's fucked up what we do. Um, and it, it feels like Alex and Jenny are, all, are just kind of like trying to, like, don't, don't forget we're doing this because we lose ourselves in the world. And when an entertaining piece of work gets you to kind of reconsider what we're doing, I think it's, you know, it's, it, it makes art into masterpieces. I'd love to hear you talk about this film and just thinking about some of the things I've enjoyed you most over over time. It's things where you have really cool stories being told in a unique manner. Westworld is the most obvious example. Perpetual Grace LTD completely fucked up that you guys didn't get a series uh, a season two. We did not with that one. And you know what? I'm throwing Always Sunny into that category as well. Yeah. So what did you appreciate about the way that this story was told? Um, yeah, again, I, I do like things that are kind of off-center. Um, I mean, most, most of my work is in something where someone's trying, well, you know, so, so, yeah, we can include Sonny. Rob, Charlie, and Glenn are, are trying to slant the camera and show you this slightly skewed but honest perspective on human beings. Westworld does it by look how depraved we can be, you know? and. And this is well. Let's put the sh let's shift the focus from another planet. How, let's look at humans that way, and that that's f endlessly appealing. Because I sometimes feel like an outsider as a human. I'm like I don't understand people, and so when someone else is str struggling with that and it comes out in a script, I'm always into it. Completely agree. Yeah. So you consider yourself a bit of a, an enigma wrapped in a question mark just in terms well, of uh, the, the human life forms walking around? Yeah, modesty aside, yeah, <laughs> I do. <laughs> yeah. I'm with you there, man. Yeah. And uh, last question. Uh, you said uh, during the photo shoot that you actually saw the premiere of Nick Cage's new movie, The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent. I don't want to put too much hype into this film. Is it the greatest comedy of all time? It's, I have not laughed and cheered for uh, 90 minutes straight in so long and I absolutely did I, abs I had a shit eating grin on my face the whole time and Nick Cage was sitting just behind me wearing a plaid <laughs> suit and being Nick Cage and just watching and it was did you see so amazing he's, he's in that elite category of people whose middle ugly. unofficial middle name is fucking yes yes and this movie nails that it really does can't wait to, uh, to see that, and I definitely can't wait to see this series, too. Jimmy, thank you so much for everything, man. Nice talking to you. Cool. You as Thanks. well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hi there, I'm Trey. Hey, Trey, how you doing? Uh, nice to meet you. Nice Hi, to meet Trey. you, too. You? Hello. Hi. You're doing very well. How are you all today? You enjoying your stay in Austin so far? Uh, we love Austin. I am now officially, though, an old person, so I'm like, it's noisy past midnight. <laughs> no, but Austin's great. I'm Austin's there, great. I'm there at 44 as well. So uh, <laughs> you guys are both writers at heart, so I'm curious. Where's your favorite place to write? Oh, what a great question. That's a really good question. Anywhere quiet, I think. Mm -hmm. Anywhere quiet. So not Austin at not midnight. <laughs> <laughs> not, uh, not, not Austin, Austin during South by Southwest. Not, yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, quiet is really essential, actually. But weirdly, sometimes I actually started writing in coffee shops, and I needed the noise kind of as white noise mm -hmm. to, to get me there. But I, I have to wear headphones. I can't actually. Um, but I think what's interesting about working in coffee shops is that your brain 
subliminally is picking up conversations around yeah. you all the time, and that somehow it's informing it a rhythm in the way you write. Yeah. Oh, very interesting. Uh, speaking of writing, obviously you write stories. This is seemingly an incredible story that's, uh, that's being continued. What's the key to a good story? That's a really good question. I think I'm, all right, I'm gonna say this like I know what I'm talking about, because it's probably different for every single person, but I'm gonna say desire and intention. I really wanna know what the fuck is going on, or I really wanna tell you. I really wanna tell you, this has to happen. My desire for this to happen is greater than anything. Something that ends with ambiguity is just, Utter, you don't have time for that, right? No, I absolutely do. Okay. If that's where the story takes you, that's where the story takes you. But from the beginning, if I am not chasing it with every fiber of my being, and for me, that comes through in the writing that the writer is opening their heart and like pouring it out on the page. Mm -hmm. I think for me, I, I need to, um, there's two things I need. One is I need to know what my emotional entry point is, always. I have to know who I am in the story. And it doesn't have to be one person, actually. It can be several people, but I need to know what I'm connecting to in the characters. Even if the characters are the bad guys, I need to know what I'm connecting to. You can switch also. Totally. I mean, the best ones do, right? Yeah. Um, but I also, I think that uh, I, I, I always need a, a seed of an image that's the, at the end of the story, hmm. and and I sort of feel that it's the right one, and then I have to build everything to get to that space. That's interesting. So that's a that's a big part of it. It's sort of having an instinct for where you want to end. I'm a big fan of tension and storytelling too. It sounds like you're kind of alluding to that as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. I think you know the key the key to tension is it, it, there's some basics, right? Like what does a character want and what's in their way mm -hmm. creates tension, and then you start to go into that and dig into that, and you can find interesting ways to throw obstacles. Mm -hmm. at the character that that like even you as the writer don't expect because now you're like how is the character going to get through that the more you the, the better you know the character the better the more obstacles you're going to be able to think mm -hmm. of if you yeah. don't if you don't know your your person or your whoever whoever your protagonist is you if you don't know them really really well you're not going to know what the obstacles are going to be yeah and I've heard uh, both y'all say in uh, interviews uh, a little bit further along the red carpet that you were trying to answer a number of questions with this mm -hmm. film and writing this film and making this film, and that included where we're going. Mm -hmm. Are you feeling optimistic or pessimistic about where we're going, and why or why not? Well, I want to clarify. We are asking the question is the most important part. I don't have the answers. I feel very optimistic because I believe in human beings. Um, and I believe that we want to keep going because we always have. But to ask the questions and to generate questions in your audience, that's the thing. Okay. That's the thing. I'm not smart enough to have the answers. Yeah, I don't think any of us would pretend to have the answers. We can only dissect what's happening in the way that we see it. And, um, and, that, and, and that means um, sort of emotionally, what is it, you know, um, the, the thing about we were talking about this earlier on the carpet, but the thing about science fiction is that it's the best science fiction is, right? It's not about the future. The future is an allegory standing for now. And it's, it allows us to really dig into what's happening now. And there's something, I, I think great art is always trying to make sense of a moment. Mm -hmm. That's where it tends to come from. It can be incredibly personal to a singular artist who's making a painting. It can be you know, a group of people deciding to make a film to answer a question that they don't have the answer to or that they think they have the answer to. But ultimately, I think it comes from that same genesis of a need to understand mm. and to make sense. And that is, I think, what art does in a beautiful way is you work through something. Um, and so that's what we're, we're doing here, you know. That, that's all we really can do. Well, thank y'all both for maneuvering through this modern dystopia to <laughs> get this film made and also yeah. come to South by Southwest. Thank, thank you. you. It's so, so great to be here. It really yeah. is. Real yeah. pleasure, y'all. Thank, 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 yeah. thank, thank you. Great questions. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Enjoy. Thanks to Gentleman Jesus for the intro and outro music. Hear more of his work at GentlemanJesus.com. And thanks to Joshua Bates for the video editing. If you have any video editing needs for Josh, hit him up on Instagram at Forager Digital thanks as always to you for checking us out you can watch listen learn and connect for free at booksonpod.com for books on pod i'm trey elling good day mm -hmm.